Are you ready? Yes. So now it's time for TED Talk. And the way this session is going to work, uh, we have four um, amazing TED speakers. They're going to come on, and they're going to speak for five minutes um, about something that they're passionate about. All the four speakers are in the area of technology um, and social media, but all of different areas, things that they are passionate about. That's the key. They'll talk for about five minutes. They'll come sit down. We'll discuss a little bit. I'll open it to the floor to hear your feedback, your observations, your questions on what they're passionate about. So we'll do probably four of those is how it's going to work. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first TED Talk speaker. And I'll do a little bit of background before I mention his name. So he is the director of digital at Stanford University. Please give a very loud and warm welcome to Adam Miller. Welcome. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, so just like Daniel said, we're fighting food coma. So I'm going to start us off. It's Los Angeles with maybe a little TV trivia. I'm just curious. Does anyone here remember uh, who shot JR? Anybody? Do you know the name? Anybody? Close? Kristen Kopp? Some, Kristen Shepard, was it? Something like that? All right, there were multiple times. Um, how many of you remember the OJ chase? Um, right? Right, exactly. There you go. There you go. How many of you remember um, Ellen's famous coming out episode in circa 1997, right? And uh, maybe a little bit more modern. How about the last episode of Breaking Bad? How many of you are part of that? So in the television industry, um, those are known as water cooler moments, right? It's a water cooler moment because it's a, a defining you know, moment in television history that people go, home, go to work the next day and talk about around the water cooler. Now, those aren't long, detailed conversations, right? Those are just enough time to grab that cup of water and talk to the person that, that you work with. Um, but they're memorable, right? They're profound. They're meaningful. And those moments are happening on social now. It's much bigger than television, right? It can be about really anything. Um, so at Stanford, we've had some good luck with those. You never know where those moments are going to come from. We call them digital water cooler moments. Um, there was an interesting one. We have a library at Stanford called Meyer Library. Um, most people would say a little bit of an eyesore, right? It was known in some eras uh, of Stanford as um, ugly was the nickname for it. That actually <laughs> stood for something. That was undergraduate library, ugly, kind of worked. Um, so anyway, Stan things changed at Stanford, so um, it was time to tear down Meyer Library. Um, so we kind of posted something on social that was, you know, any Meyer memories as we were showing the demolition starting to happen. And there was just an outpouring, right, of all these stories, right? We had 551 comments on that post. And they weren't LOL comments. They were deep stories across a whole bunch of eras, right? Um, really meaningful. We did some analysis on who actually uh, wa were the people doing that commenting, and we found that 10% of those were actually some segments in our behavioral segmentation model that are really hard for us to reach, so we're getting some new kinds of people. And all of this just on an ordinary Thursday afternoon. This wasn't something that a lot of resources went into, a lot of planning went into. It's just sort of harnessing that moment. And at Stanford, we view social really as a program in its own right. You'll hear us talk about that. It's not a marketing channel. It's not a communication, right? It, uh, it isn't something that is set to drive conversions for anything within the Alumni Association or beyond. Don't get me wrong, we definitely help with conversions, and we're happy about that. In a recent uh, social media survey that we did, we found that 40% of our followers um, said that their experience with us on social made them more interested in attending events at Stanford. 30% more interested in reading the Stanford Magazine, 30% more interested in volunteering, and 20% more interested in donating to the university, though that isn't our charge at the Alumni Association. We're separate from our development office. But buckle up, those aren't the biggest numbers. We actually asked a new question uh, this last social media survey that was trying to get at that program metric, right? Not the conversions but the program metric. So how are we doing as a program in our own right? We asked a question, because of my experience on Stanford social media, I have dot, 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 and we asked a series of activities, right? So you heard me say 40% events, 30% magazine. We found that s over 70% of people said that because of Stanford social media, they have learned something new, right? Isn't that kind of nice? Over 60% said they had been inspired by Stanford. Right? Over 60% um, had shared a moment of pride with others in the alumni or Stanford community. One of my personal favorites, over 60% said they'd had a laugh with us. 
right? And then over 50% said that um, they had shared a defining moment in the life of the alumni community and felt uh, like Stanford was part of their daily life again, right? That's pretty profound. And that's really, you know, why is all of this important? This, to us, is uh, in a lot of ways the future of engagement, right? You have to look at this as a program, you know, invest in it, and look at your whole investment portfolio and how you invest in this along with the sort of more traditional programs that you do to kind of prepare for a world that is going to look different, right? Engagement will look different, and there will be new kinds of water cooler. So my advice to all of you would be build true organic community. Strategically, think of your, your social efforts as a program and invest in them over a long horizon, right? Look out for those water cooler moments. You never know what they're going to be, um, so you kind of have to guess. But as a, as a quick hint, they're usually more about buildings getting torn down than buildings getting built, um, literally and metaphorically. Um, and then sort of, you know, go out there and seize that water cooler moment um, and do the best you can. So thank you. I, I have a ton of thoughts and questions. Uh, just before I monopolize the time, if you have a thought or a question or an observation uh, on any of the TED Talks, when the person sits down, please just raise your hand so I can gauge whether I need to widen. Great. So we have one. Anyone else before I dive in? So, um, Robert, can we get some microphones? Mm -hmm. so my, my question is, how do you navigate when the Alumni Association wants to be authentic around a topic that is controversial for the university. Mm -hmm. And they're not really willing to be as authentic or forthcoming. How do you all handle that? Brilliant Great question. question. Great question. A quick answer to that would be, I think you have to use data. You have to really represent your audience. You almost consider yourself a little bit of a publication on social. So you report to your readers of that publication, right? So you want to tap into what they are already talking about and what they care about and sort of funnel that information, keep that information, similar to what we heard in an earlier session, to the right people of, of leadership at your institution at all levels. So keep that data flowing, and I think that helps you. And then I think, as you've heard from many people talking about social, is you don't want to shy away from it, right? I think you can really uh, show leadership um, within your institution and then your institution more broadly by actually tackling some of those with, with when you have something to say, when you have that right angle on that. Yep. Great question. I, I, th I think it, w it, was a, it was a very, very good question because if you think about these moments, mm -hmm. the more controversial, the better. Right. In terms of social media, in terms of right. sharing, in terms of likes, in terms of it going wild, which is my experience of education institutions is that they can be yeah. How can I put it? A little bit conservative and risk averse. Right. So, how would you balance that? I mean. Yeah, I think you know I, I completely agree. Apathy can be the enemy in alumni engagement. I'm like, do you want people just not to care, or do you want to fire them up a little bit? Not fire them up so that we're getting calls from all over our campus um, that aren't really happy, but um, at the same time to take some of these issues on. You know, we've done this with customer service fails where we've had some problems all the way up to more meaty kind of campus-wide discussions. But I think it's it's nice. It's back to the two-way kind of role that we play. C right? Controversy is good. Yeah. Controversy is engaging. It's the voice of the alumni community back to Stanford as right. well or back to your institution. I think sometimes we're, we're almost uh, scared of our alumni. Right. right. <laughs> so we, we want to engage them, but we're not prepared to, to give them the microphone. Yeah. And there's no hiding on social. So even if you think you are, you're not, right? Absolutely. So I, I, I had another thought in terms of this seems like a great tactic. Yeah. Could you turn it into a strategy? Mm -hmm. Could you turn it into a consistent strategy of coming up with these moments, thinking about the controversial ones that will be passed, but that can go, I mean, rather than turning it as a one-off, how would you turn this into a full-blown social strategy? You could. You could. I think there's, there's gathering data as you go along. So the ones that we've witnessed in real life are things like the, the Meyer Library. We've seen that with other buildings getting torn down that have some emotional connection. Um, there was a passing of a beloved uh, dean of admissions, Dean Fred Hargadon, um, that really resonated, of course, with the classes of the 70s and early 80s. So that was a major moment that they really shared together. Um, so you can sort of see some of these things coming as you start to get an eye for them. They can also go way beyond your institution. So the Olympics coming up this summer are big you know, in lots of ways that um, we had some fun with that last time of, of not having spoilers and having, you know, how we sort of, you know, showcase the stories in the right way that people actually want to talk about anyway 
when they're at work on Monday morning, and then they're talking about it with us and with the alumni community. So you can kind of see some of them coming. There'll be ones you can't see coming at all. And, and in that case, it's more about being nimble, right, and being able to sort Taking of jump. advantage of it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Finding that energy and seeing if you can capitalize now, on I, it. I think what the other thing I found quite eye-opening from your talk was I often think about you know, how institutions can play a role in the daily lives of alumni. Right. And I'm normally drawn to the professional side, that, the career side. That's the sure. almost the, the obvious one. The social side, I've always been a little bit cynical. Mm -hmm. right? Every institution has a Facebook page. So they're liking it, big, di big deal, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But what I think was eye-opening was you seem to go deeper in that. It had a, a yeah. bigger impact than I would have expected. Why? Why, why? why is that having that sort of yeah. impact? Please. I would like, like to say that's the, the, a symptom of true community, right? I think that could happen even with the community you're building here in this room, right? It starts to be about a topic that we first, oh, we're also interested in careers, so we start there. But it goes a lot deeper pretty quickly, right? Other aspects of people's lives, other, you know, they're whole people. I think that's what it is. And so if we built our communities of alumni in the right way, then they talk about what's important to them at any given time, at any given, you know, not even only when things are going well, but when things aren't going so well, right, in their lives. So if we start to see some of that, we feel like, oh, we're starting to really tap into some real community. And when you get to that, it kind of doesn't matter where it plays out. That would be no different if it was in the hallway or on Facebook, in an email exchange, on a platform, you know. And it, and it feels like it's, it's almost you're giving the ownership back to the alumni, right? So right. this is the idea of, as I said, we, we're afraid to give them the microphone. We want engagement, but we're afraid to give them the microphone. Yeah. But for the alumni to feel really engaged, they need to, they need to own their own network. Yeah. They need to be driving it. So how could you get these moments driven by the alumni rather than from the institution? How could that happen? That's a good question. Um, you know, it's sort of a push and pull, I yeah. think, because we sometimes have to put a little bit of the fodder out there to get the energy going, you know. But there are times, you know, they don't take it. They don't pick that up. So you have to, you know. You need more controversy. Right, right you exactly. You say, oh, turn that up a little bit. <laughs> so um, I think you just have to, in maybe in your content strategy as you think about this, you try to hedge your bets a bit and sort of diversify your investments, right, over, over what you do. And then you'll get lucky with some of these times. And you'll learn from your own water cooler moments. It's probably, we have some similarities across institutions, but you'll have some of your own flavor that you won't see coming. So just make sure you capture that learning, right, for the next time. Wonderful. Okay. So look, um, yes, please. Thank you. My name is Rachel Jimenez from Claremont Graduate University, and I manage the Drucker School's social media, but one of my problems and challenges is that alumni are all shapes and sizes and ages and come from various backgrounds, and usually with business school, you learn that you need to pick your target market. So how do you manage that and try to target people when they're everybody? Great question. Yeah, we would look at that not at the community or channel level of, say, Facebook. We would look at that at the content level of what we're doing. So we're trying to look at some different content that could appeal to some growth segments. Um, in our world, that's actually graduate-only alumni that we're trying to, re you know, we have pretty good coverage of undergrad, as many of us do, but we've gone over to the grad student side of campus to try to, you know, they're installing some new roundabouts over there that are just kind of comical because <laughs> it used to be an intersection of death where all the bikes would kind of, and now there are these roundabouts. So it's like something that will resonate with that grad only experience um, and just try some of these new, it's all experimental as you know in social. So you're, you're like the naughty boy of the department. Is that? No, no, so within, a, within ask within, Howard. Well, Howard's sitting back well, there. He, so. he did mention it to me before. But it's, uh, <laughs> all right, so look, I just want to, on behalf of everybody, Say a big thank you to Adam. Adam, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And I now would like to invite our second TED speaker, uh, Charlie Cumber, who is the Executive Vice President, I'm going to get your full title, Charlie, of Corporate and Product Strategy at Blackboard. The floor is yours, please. Thanks, Daniel. So I'd like to take five minutes and talk to you a little bit about technology and data and how it could help your organizations more effectively engage alumni. A study was recently published by CASE, the Council on Advancement for um, Education, and the number one thing that the study showed was important in colleges and universities today with social media is how can we drive alumni engagement? There were others, how do we build brand, how do we create community, how do we um, drive advocacy, but 84% of the people in this survey put alumni engagement at the top of their list. So how, 
we've talked a lot about a lot of things here, and I'm going to talk for a moment about how you can apply science, technology, to data that you have and that's available to you to help improve that. So here's the problem. All of you, I'm sure, um, have and know your go-to alumni. How many of you have enough go-to alumni that you can count on to help you with an alumni engagement? Show of hands. Okay, well, I expect you would. <laughs> Not many in the room. So, so what I'm going to share with you is something that I think can help uncover who the next group of engaged alumni can be. And it's a function of applying what you know about them to the things you don't know about them and statistical modeling to uncover those hidden gems in your database. Now, we've done this for years in fundraising. So let me give you an example. With um, predictive modeling for fundraising, we often will uncover prospects in a, in a university's database that have great propensity to become major gift donors, planned gift donors, sustainers, you name it. And yet they've never been cultivated and they may not have ever even been contacted because they never surfaced in your data. Well, the same thing is true, we believe, in applying that to alumni engagement. And over the last two years, we've begun to apply some of the same techniques to modeling how you can uncover alumni in your files that have a propensity to engage with the university and have social influence in social networks. Now, here's the problem. So, many of you is, is I've talked about applying fundraising. Many of you have limited resources. And what we have learned is that by targeting people that have both a propensity and an ability to give, you can be more effective. Let's say you have a file of 100,000 friends and alumni. You've got four or five major gift officers. They can handle 150 or 200 prospects. You're left with, how do I focus on the 1% of my file that matters? Using wealth as an indicator is a good example. People with money, it's good. That doesn't mean they're going to give. Better is, comparing, is, is including modeling to understand their likelihood of giving. Well, we take the same approach with alumni engagement, and here's how it works. So first, let's look at the data that you have on your alumni. That includes their experience as undergrads, their majors, their class years, their involvement in, in the community. Also includes their engagement since they've graduated. Have they come to events? Are they a donor? What, what do you know about them? We take that and append external publicly available information that helps you understand more about that person, their philanthropic behavior, their consumer preferences, other indicators that can be informative in understanding the likelihood and connections they may have to your university. We also use social data, so their social scores, what networks they're on, how active they are, and so forth, as part of that input. We take that combined data and let data scientists then look for patterns. What's predictive of someone who's likely to engage and has social influence in your community? And the end result is, is um, normally we find about 5% of your alumni, many of whom are are not engaged, have a high propensity or high likelihood of engaging and an ability to influence other alumni. And so what we suggest people do is focus on that 5%. And how do you do that? Well, you could look through your information to find connections, things they already have in relationships with the university. You could survey them to see what their interests are. You could adapt your direct mail and other channels of communications to target their interests better, include them, look at their geographic proximity to existing groups, events, opportunities to engage them. Finally, you might pick up the phone and call them. Chances are they'll take the call if, they, if the models are predictive and we find they are. So at the end of the day, I think what, what we're enabling organizations to do is, is get to the next level of alumni that are most likely to be a benefit to your programs. And then using that with the scarce resources most of you have to go develop relationships with those alumni. Thanks a lot for your attention today. Uh, look, it's, it's interesting that the, the whole area of big data 
Okay, big data has touched so many other industries, but yet our industry feels a little bit antiquated. It hasn't quite reached here. Um, I think there's some fantastic companies like Blackboard and obviously Evertree that I know as well who do a lot of great analytics and, and starting mm -hmm. to open this, this kind of words of trying to bring big data insights yeah. into our world. And I think I'd just start off with um, what are the most important variables? So if you know, our delegates go home and they go, you know what, we can do much more predictive analysis going forward. What is the core data that you think that they should start with? If they could only focus, let's say, on three data points yeah, or variables, which would be the three that you I would focus on? I don't actually think you can focus on three okay. because they're usually different. There are some that are in common. There are some you will know. I mean, if they've been engaged in different ways with the institution, that can be a predictor. But there's some things you wouldn't know. Their location, proximity to things that might um, indicate that, or some consumer preferences or philanthropic behavior in general. That, and every model is, is unique to the data set that, that we use. Um, we've recently started using machine learning to uncover other um, insights from the data, which is an interesting new technology as well. And I think what you have to do is ex pull as much information together as you, you do have, couple that with the appropriate external information, and then let the model, let the science point you to what's predictive of someone who's likely to engage. Then you can use those predictors to go target um, building relationships with those alumni that fit that characteristic. Right. So, I mean, again, it sounds a lot of our audience are alumni relations people. So right. th this is a very ROI development focus, right? That we're going to start with who is most likely to give right. and then sort of work, work backwards from that point, right? So if I know A, B, and C have these uh, variables about them, I'm going to start developing my alumni relations programs to, ident to target that. Th I mean, that, well, that would be the well, conclusion, right? Well, I think right? that what we're applying is the same approach, but to a different problem. Okay. One problem is how to find the, the people most likely to make significant contributions or, you know, or not, you know, they yeah. could be annual fund or sustainers as well, but most likely to take action as a result of my cultivating that. We're applying the same approach to how do you identify alumni that are most likely to engage with you when approached with the right programs, the right opportunities. The things we've talked about here all still apply. All we're doing is trying to help organizations focus on the 5% first that could really move the needle. And we've seen that, that happen. And, it, it, and it's no different than finding the person in your database who you've never talked to who can write a seven-figure check. And finding people in your database that are very influential on social networks and have a propensity to, to work with you um, is the same principle. And it's, it's interesting. So you're already bringing the, the two things to hand on the emphasis. One is the propensity. Right. But the other one is about the, the influence of the individual. And in, in our case with this, the value has more to do with their influence in social networks and the, the um, other impact they can have, you know, once they become ambassadors, to use, you know, the, the term you were using. Yeah. And, and it's no different than the same was true with, with major gift or plan gift prospects you want people who have the capacity and the propensity at the same time. So I, I just want to open it to the floor. There are there any examples out there, and I'll come to you, of any of your work that you've done where you've done deep analytics, where you've done this sort of correlation to look at the predictions of anything anyone wanted to share today? You, I saw a hand. Did you want to? Oh, so, okay. so if, if I look around. So please ask your question. Great. My question went back to a comment that was made at the last session regarding a particular donor saying the stewardship, you didn't steward me correctly. And so there is identifying the ideal donors, that top 1%, as you mentioned, using behavioral science, which I just think mm -hmm. that's fantastic. But can we also use big data to look at best ways to steward a particular donor in a way to get that gift? So it's one, identifying and two, then looking back at the steps through science and then coming up with a prescriptive approach with your data set. So I, I think you can do that in certain cases. For example, if, if you're trying to model an improvement in your annual fund performance, um, you can model targeted ask amounts and things like that to, to improve the, the return on the annual fund effort. I think when you're talking about very influential people or very wealthy people, 
the homework you have to do on that individual, the relationship they have with you or don't, the connections they have among your group, and is a very individualized thing that somebody has to do in order to make the right first step and then learn from that step and continue the process. And, and I, I don't think we've ever really modeled for major gift prospects, do these five things and they'll write a big check. So, um, and I, I don't think it works in the, the case of engaging alumni either. Great. So when you find somebody who's very influential and has a high score, we, when we do this, we score them one to a thousand. And if somebody has a score in the 900 to a thousand range, they're highly likely to engage. So then it's a matter of figuring out what their interests are, how to engage them, and how to get them to take that first step, and then build on that. And this question was behind you. Was it Aristotle that says, choice, not chance, determines destiny? And I, I really believe that data is helping us make many more wise decisions in how we allocate resources and develop strategy. The concern I hear from a few out there in our world of global terrorism is we are the keepers and stewards of some phenomenal data on people. We have their children's names, their social security numbers, where they work, live, and have been their whole life. As an industry leader, what are you doing to address uh, any concerns out there about the care and the keeping of that data? Well, so there are two answers to your question. One is their data privacy um, regulations that are different in different parts of the world, and, and we do our best to respect those and understand them. The second is, um, in our efforts to strengthen our products in light of some of those concerns, we've chosen to partner with um, major providers, in the case, in our case, Amazon and, and Microsoft, who are experts in, in providing highly secure, highly reliable, highly performant infrastructure on which to run our applications. And we rely on them heavily for some of the security and data protection that you need. And, and if you look at what some of them are doing and the kind of clients they work with, it's really phenomenal. So we're not trying to be experts in that area. We're trying to leverage their skills, their ability to invest at a global scale that, that we don't have and, and bring that to um, organizations like yours. Wonderful. So we're out of time, but I just want to say on part of thank you, Charlie. Charlie Cumber, sure. thank you very, very much. <laughs> And our next uh, TED speaker, no stranger to GLS, uh, he is the Senior Director for Social Media Strategy, Alumni Affairs and Development at Cornell University. It's Andrew Gosen. Andrew, the floor is yours. Daniel. <coughs> so the future of alumni relations is here, and it is a digital future. Institutional advancement has made huge strides over the past five years. We're no longer pretending that the digital revolution isn't happening or wishing that it would go away. We're beginning to invest money in digital communications platforms and the staff to manage those platforms. And these are all really, really good and exciting things. But I do think that we have a tendency to think that just because we're using new tools to communicate with our alumni, that that alone is going to solve our problems. And the point I want to share with you today is that that alone is not enough. And don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of the new tools, but the new tools are not the complete puzzle. They're an important part of the puzzle, but there's another piece that is equally important, and that is beginning to evolve our organizations in such a way that we can take advantage of the opportunities that are opened up to us by the emergence of these new technologies. There's actually a term for this kind of a transition. It's called digital first, and it's an idea that's been getting increasing traction over the past couple of years. What it means is a shift in the way that we do things and the way that we think about what we're doing in such a way that digital becomes our new default setting. I first came across the idea of digital first in the New York Times Digital Innovation Report, which was released back in spring of 2014. The report was commissioned by the Times in response to their realization that their current business model was no longer competitive. Everything that the Times did, from its org chart to its business processes to its editorial process, revolved around the production and distribution of a daily print newspaper. Sure, they had a website, but that was simply viewed as an add-on that was an additional channel they could use to push out content that they were making through their established processes. They realized they had a problem when they figured out that BuzzFeed was taking content from the Times, chopping it up, reformatting it in BuzzFeed formats like listicles, and then drawing audiences that were orders of magnitude larger than the audiences that the Times was getting on its own website. They took a close look at BuzzFeed and some of the other digital platforms that have been evolving in the publishing space over the past couple or three years, 
And they realized that they had to make some fundamental changes in the way that they approached their business in order to remain competitive in the long term. I think that Alumni Relations is in a position that's very similar to where the New York Times was. We've done some great work over the past decades and we've served our institutions really well. But the world in which we're working is changing and the way that we work needs to change as well. <clears throat> so, I've spent a lot of time over the past 18 months thinking about what digital first alumni relations might look like. And I'm sad to tell you that I don't have any answers, although I have a lot of great questions. In the process of doing this, I've also come across a series of ideas that I'm pretty sure are going to play an important role in those answers once they, fight start, start, once they finally start coming into focus. And I'd like to share one of these with you in the remainder of my time today. It has to do with networks. I think we need to start taking networks much more seriously, thinking about what they are, how they work, and the implications of that for the work that we do. One of the most interesting things that I've encountered recently about networks comes from Stanley McChrystal, who's a former American general who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and who currently is utilizing some of his insights from his career in the service in the field of organizational change. When McChrystal arrived in Iraq in 2003 to take charge of the US Joint Special Operations Task Force, he was confronted with a really pressing problem. How was it that the world's most powerful military was having such a hard time coming to terms with Al-Qaeda in Iraq, an opponent that by any standard was smaller, disorganized, and much less well-equipped? He ultimately concluded that it had something to do with the way that the units under his command were organized and the way that they worked together. The US military, of course, is famously regimented and hierarchical, and against an opponent organized in a similar way, they're almost impossible to beat. The problem was that that wasn't how Al-Qaeda in Iraq was organized. Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a loose, diffuse, constantly shifting group of people that grew and contracted as circumstances on the ground changed. They were a network, and McChrystal's organization couldn't cope with that. So he started thinking about this, and ultimately he had this flash of insight when he asked himself the question, maybe it takes a network to defeat a network. So if you're in the military, of course, you're not going to be able to say, okay, we're doing away with rank and chain of command and everybody can do whatever they want, whenever they want. That's, that's a non-starter. But what they could do was begin to incorporate into the way that they worked with each other some aspects of the way that networks work. For instance, they decentralized decision-making authority and diffused it down throughout the organization in such a way that local commanders could see opportunities and act on them instantly instead of having to go up the chain of command. They realized that it was counterproductive to operate in these very strictly defined operational silos, so they began to collaborate in ways that they'd never done before. They didn't just collaborate with current partners in ways that they'd never done before, but they recognized that they had to open up the network in such a way that any person or any group who had some sort of information relevant to the task at hand was invited to the table, even if there was no precedent in the organization for that sort of inclusion before. When it came to deciding who was involved in things, they realized that competence had to take priority over rank. They realized that they couldn't afford to take anything for granted, either about their own organization or about their opponent. So they implemented a process whereby they were constantly interrogating all of their fundamental assumptions about who they were and what they were doing. And by combining all of these behaviors together, they began acting like a network that had actually learned how to learn. And this actually began to make a substantial difference on the ground. All of a sudden, they were unpredictable, they were agile, they were opportunistic, they were behaving like a network, and over time they turned the tide, and it turned out that McChrystal was right. It did take a network to defeat a network. So let's pivot now to alumni relations. I've spent a lot of time looking at alumni affairs org charts. I'm sure many of you have as well. If it's a big enough organization, there are a lot of levels in the hierarchy. There are a whole lot of operational units. You've got all the program areas, classes, clubs, reunions, so on and so forth, right? So I'm not naive enough to think that we can do away with all that, but I do think that if we took some of these insights that McChrystal derived from his experience in Iraq and began to apply them in our organizations, we would make some fundamental changes that would put us in a much better position to take advantage of the opportunities that are opened up to us by these new technologies. The new tools alone are not going to help us do what we have to do to serve our institutions. The new tools plus a pivot to digital first deploying some of these new approaches to working together and collaborating and, and pushing our efforts out deeper into the network that we serve, I think that has real potential to make a difference. Thank you. It's a great talk, Andrew. I'm, I often um, 
will speak to an institution who will very apologetically begin the conversation by saying, look, we're new to alumni relations. Uh, we have no history in it. We've never done anything before. I'm a one-man show, okay? And I think fantastic, because I also deal with the other extreme mm -hmm. of organizations who are massive, who have been doing tons of things for years, who are stuck in the yep. mud, and so bureaucratic, they can't think, and they can't change, and they can't do. And wouldn't it be nice to start from a blank piece of paper? That's pretty scary to do. And so the question for you, Andrew, I'm talking too much, but the question would mm -hmm. be for you, if I gave you that blank piece of paper, where would you start? I think it's really important when we're thinking about digital first not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's abundantly clear that many of our program areas and our conventional engagement strategies have delivered tremendous value for 100 years. I mean, it, we're not that far from the 100th anniversary of, of um, the Association of Alumni Secretaries, which was the forerunner organization for CASE. So we don't want to lose what we've got, but at the same time, we want to acknowledge that there is a ceiling to what those programs can do for us. Um, I think we're in an industry where a 30% engagement rate is actually pretty darn good, comparatively speaking, and we can pat ourselves on the back. And I always ask myself, okay, well, what about the other 70%? Because I refuse to concede that the other 70% of Cornell alumni are so alienated from the alma mater that they're never going to engage. So we want to retain those existing programs that have served us well, but where digital first comes into play is that those program areas need to think about how digital fits into the things that they do. Then following on from that, I really, I liked Adam's point about thinking about social as a program area. And I really very much think of digital as a program area in and of itself, uh, because we've got huge populations there with people scattered all throughout the pyramid, all sorts of capacity, all sorts of different types of interest, um, a range of diversity that we may not see in populations that we're engaging through other other program areas, and we need to start thinking carefully and strategically about how we're going to use digital to reach out and engage those. So I, I think it's a combination of the old and the new, but recognizing that the old needs to think about how digital can transform what they do. I actually have a good example of this. The University of Surrey uh, just published a marvelous blog post, and they're in an institution where they have to do an annual report, which conventionally has been this sort of thick, one-pound, fly-killing uh, <laughs> print document. And they did an experiment, and they had the digital team sit down with the people who had produced this from the very beginning, and they strategized a, a new way to go about doing this. So they still produced the print report, but they also produced a series of 90-second videos that pulled, called out particularly interesting bits, and they put together an infographic, and one of these videos drew 81,000 views. And can you imagine 81,000 people being interested in any aspect of an annual report? No. That absolutely blows my mind. And I think that's a great example of what we can do if we use this digital first idea to just reconceptualize a lot of the stuff we've always been doing in the past. Before I ask my three or four more questions I have, I just want to hog the floor. Has anyone got any thoughts or questions otherwise? Oh, please. Krista outshorn hobo with Keck Graduate uh, Institute in Claremont, California. Um, so I've been working um, and living in Europe for the last 20 years and just relocated to the US. And I've been living in the Netherlands, which is famous for the Polder model. Mm -hmm. And it made me think of what you were talking about with the general, um, bringing everyone who has anything to do with anything to the table to, you know, exp you know, the Dutch like to give their opinions and vent. And then the leader can decide to go a different direction, but at least everyone's you know, had their say, so to speak. So I brought this up at our, you know, staff town hall meeting the other day, and I just, I felt like, oh dear, you know, um, I feel like I'm introducing this new idea, um, which I think would be really helpful, um, but I, I noticed that in um, higher ed, because I've been working in a different industry for the last 11 years, um, there's a lot of this silo idea oh, that's my area, or that's your area, or, you know, and never the twain shall meet. And I, I just wonder, do you have ideas or suggestions or anyone else on how you can kind of get your development folks, your marketing folks to help you, you know, to work together, because we all want the same thing, ultimately. Right. I think keeping your eye on the end goal is absolutely essential to this. I mean, when I got to Cornell six years ago, 
it took a while for the organization to metabolize the fact that, that my team was there and that we weren't going away. But in, a, in an environment where there, there are skeptics, and sometimes the skeptics are pretty vocal, uh, there was one person who used to wander around the building offering to buy people lunch if they could tell her what my team did, which was, I appreciated that. Um, <laughs> You've got, to, you've got to find the people who are willing to work with you up front and to ask some of these questions that, that dive into the, the points of intersection between various different program areas but have the potential to really advance outcomes in both areas. And my experience has been that there are people in almost any organization who are interested in this type of experimentation. If you do it thoughtfully, it's not difficult to make other people look good because they have collaborated with you to innovate. And once you've established that the sun is going to continue to rise in the east every morning, even if you experiment with new things, um, and that things are successful, people like to be on a, willing on a winning team. And they're increasingly willing to, to give you the benefit of it out and try it out. And I, nobody, nobody likes to do the same thing over and over again. I think um, people are aware that the world is changing. And if someone can help them figure out what to do with it and articulate the impact of that in terms that are relevant to them, um, I don't think that, that it's as hard to overcome that sort of inertia as it, it seems on the surface. Um, I'm gonna have to wrap up. I can see there's more questions, but what we'll have to do right after, but I think, Andrew, it was great that you were able to give us both a very high level objective of what we're trying to get digital first and actually ended with some very practical first steps of how you might implement that in an organization. So everyone, big round of applause for Andrew. <laughs> And last, but definitely not least, um, I'm going to welcome the Director of Career Services at Princeton University, um, Eva Google. And Eva, we're going to start with a video, but the floor is yours. My esteemed colleagues flew without a net, and I, I am so in awe of them. Um, I do have some slides as backup. Um, but I'm going to share with you a little bit about um, the ways that we're using social media and technology within career services to sort of build connections and build communities for students and alumni. Uh, we take sort of a three-prong approach. Um, across all of our social platforms, we create educational career content, inspiring stories, um, videos to really help sort of create top of mind awareness among students um, about career development development in a sort of less intimidating way, um, sort of bringing the content to where they're spending a lot of time, right, um, across multiple social, social channels. Um, in addition to that, we take our educational mission really, really seriously. Um, so that in one-on-one -on -one advising with students and alumni, we're providing LinkedIn profile critique. We're sharing with them how to establish thought leadership among, you know, across various social channels. We're directing them to the many interest-based communities that exist among our alumni and also various professional groups. Um, so in that way, we're sort of inspiring them to use social media for their own personal and professional branding um, and, and also helping them to connect for a lifetime with some of these communities. Um, and sort of the third way um, that we're using social media is to proactively go out and source opportunities for our students and proactively build those connections and those communities that don't exist today um, and ensure that they're there for those students and alumni um, as those interests start to evolve and change and grow over the course of their lifetime and their careers. Um, so that's sort of the genesis around um, where the idea for Princeton Social Media Day came from. We took this really sort of broad-based community approach to educating and um, sort of inspiring our community to use um, social media to connect and build communities. And so how could we do that if we weren't really sort of engaging the entire campus in this conversation? Um, so one of, one of the, uh, we want to cue this slide. Uh, one of the fun little facts I like to point out is we like to engage in fun and sort of, as I said, non-intimidating ways. Um, the Princeton Entrepreneur Club last uh, semester actually dubbed me the fairy job mother. Um, and so that if you go onto my Twitter handle, you'll see that that's sort of the hashtag fairy job mother. I have this whole campaign that I'll be launching next semester with tips from the fairy job mother. And I wear that badge really proudly um, because it is really important to connect with them in ways, you know, where it's, again, 
we're all, you know, sort of, you know, wanting that human connection, right? And so the term career can be really awesome and, in, and sort of intimidating to students. And so if I can break it down in fun and engaging ways for them, um, I, you know, I want to do that. Um, so back to Princeton Social Media Day and how does this all fit together? Um, you can see we were having a lot of fun <laughs> that day. And again, it was a way for us to feature students, faculty, staff, and alumni in sharing their stories and really illustrating best practices in how we can use social media as a community, right? And so collectively sharing those stories. Um, so our goal was really educate, engage, and empower the entire community to raise the bar on our social efforts across campus and beyond. Um, so here's a quick video clip to tell you a little bit about the day. Social, it's just changed the way we think about professional and personal and it has blended everything together. And everybody in our world is in this space. Man, that changes the party, right? We actually have a whole generation of kids out there right now who have never experienced a world in which touchscreen devices with constant connectivity doesn't exist. And there is no way that 40% of the planet can start doing something without triggering some social and cultural changes. I do think what we're all talking about in a way is a kind of thought leadership. These platforms allow us to join ongoing conversations, to get the work out, to find the niche communities, and to sort of curate conversations that might not be happening elsewhere. Today's goal is to really inspire all of us, faculty, staff, and students, to take our social media efforts to new heights. We do have individual social media doctoring sessions. We also have two professional photographers who are on hand to give free profile headshot photos all day long. So that just gives you a little flavor. For more information, you can certainly read my blog on LinkedIn. It's sort of epically long, but <laughs> there was lots happening and lots of great conversations. So we had three guiding principles for the day. Help everyone learn, share, and connect. And we did this, and we were really intentional about doing this in a really collaborative way across campus. So we partnered with every corner of the campus um, and enlisting their support in reaching out to alumni that we could bring back as industry experts to share all the different ways that they were using social media in their industries. In particular, we wanted to focus on industries that were sort of underrepresented with respect to those opportunities coming to campus. So the arts, they don't, they don't recruit in the traditional ways in the arts, right? So it's really important to build these communities and these connections and also to, to really look to your alums in those industries to become champions for your students and advocates for your students. So we wanted to feature, so we had uh, alums from journalism, the arts, um, entrepreneurs. We had uh, many uh, alums that came back from the Princeton Entrepreneur Network to share the stories of how they were using social media. And so this really sort of fueled the day. Um, really, again, I think one of the things that we wanted to do was also sort of rebrand the Career Center in this, in this way as well, because we were shifting from a very traditional career services oriented model where, you know, you offer sort of a menu of services and students and alums can engage with you or not. It's sort of, you know, a volitional service. We were shifting away from that to become much more a career connections model mm -hmm. and to be really proactive about the ways that we were engaging employers and alumni in bringing those opportunities back to campus and making those connections and communities happen. Um, the other thing that we really did was we tried to innovate, or, or rather showcase, all of the innovative ways that social media was already being used across campus. Um, so ways that our faculty and staff and others were using social media to tell our institutional story. Um, so from athletics to alumni affairs, communications, admissions, and, and beyond. Here are some of the stats, you know, I mean, just just one day of you know, 14 sessions yielded all of this information. So 11.6 million impressions. We were uh, featured in 19 different countries. Actually, we were trending in the US and in Scotland. Um, our, 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 one of the institutions, the University of Western Scotland, has a, a statue of John Witherspoon, who was the sixth 
president of Princeton University. They have the same statue as we do. And so they were tweeting and following along all day and sort of egg egging us on. Um, we had 250 folks get you know, LinkedIn profile headshots. If nothing else, that was a huge service, I think, um, you know, in getting rid of those sort of vacant head on most people's profiles, right? Um, 165 patients for our social media doctors, literally one-on-one -on -one advising. Um, we brought in uh, someone from LinkedIn. We had several consultants along with our career center staff sitting there giving them that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so again, 1.4 million people reached with 580 posts. There was a lot of traction, and there still is wow. a lot of traction on the PU Social Day hashtag. So we go to the next slide. Some of the feedback from our participants um, included everyone, you know, and again, anecdotal. This is anecdotal feedback. This was also feedback from focus groups. Um, and as we gathered for debrief sessions with every one of our campus partners, um, learned at least one new tool or tactic, um, improved one or more of their current profiles, expanded their social repertoire to include a new platform. More people were going off to Instagram than we've ever seen, um, raised awareness of the importance of their digital identity. Again, really important for the students, but also just sort of more broadly across campus for faculty and staff. Um, boosted their confidence in using social media. It was really important to us to offer content that would appeal to every level of social media expertise. So from the beginner to the novice, you know, sort of to the expert level. Um, and gained an understanding of ways that they could use social media, um, again, or ways social media was being used by alumni in those specific professions. I think the last thing um, was that everyone reported having connected with at least two or more individuals in interest-based communities. Pretty How fabulous is that in one day to have those connections fired up in that way? Um, so, I'm, I'm amazing. I want to grill you. So please, What's ever thank you very, very much. much. We have about three minutes. Yes. And I have about 20 different topics I want to chat to you about. So I'll mention the topics, and I'll probably just ask one question, right? So I think you know, this personal branding idea is so important. I think you're highlighting a game, which we've not talked enough about today. I think the, the massive importance of LinkedIn uh, for career services. Um, I think another element was your connections between career services and alumni relations. And I think great examples. But the question I'll ask you really is about this career connections, this concept of career connections. Um, where's this going to go at Princeton? Yeah, at the moment, you think of yourself as career services and you're trying to transition to career connections. What, yeah. what would that look like in two years' time when we bring you back and you'll, you'll talk about career connections, what you've done at Princeton? How will, that, how will your department change going forward? Yeah, so, so two important ways. I mean, we've changed our mission um, to really focus on helping students define a unique and career career and life vision for themselves, and then really proactively and um, sort of in personalized and multidimensional ways help to connect them to the people, the resources, the organizations, and the opportunities that will help them bring that career and life vision um, to reality. So that's, that's a fundamental shift for us. In addition, now we're looking at what are some of the metrics that will help us measure those connections, the impacts of those connections between alumni and students. Um, for the class of 2015, for the first time, we actually measured and asked a question on the survey um, whether or not uh, their interaction with alumni influenced their career decision making for their first opportunity out of school. 12.2% of the class reported that an alum had influenced their career decision making. I want to see that metric grow, right? And so I think that will be part of the way that when we come back and we talk about the career connections model, um, I want to see even more students reporting that they had, you know, sort of systematic contact with alums, they had imp influencers um, or mentors, you know, that were alumni that really helped them um, connect with opportunities. Amazing. And I think it's a huge win-win opportunity, right, mm -hmm. to bring these two departments more integrated yes. to help alumni with more career service offerings and allow them also the opportunity to give back yes, to yes. students. Yes, and our mandate is, you know, we, we serve undergraduate students, graduate students, and alumni. So it is career services for a lifetime. Wonderful. So I'm going to just summarize in literally one minute, I think, the four, four takeaways that I took from, from our four amazing speakers. So Adam, I wrote down here, okay, the power of social media um, and really embracing uh, controversy 
as a strategy, I wrote down, okay, rather than a tactic. How can we use social media and not be fearful of it? Um, Charlie, I think the power of big data, um, predictive modeling and taking it to a new level. I'm de delighted to hear Blackboard moving on as a great CRM provider, but also now allowing us to extract even more value from that data. Um, Andrew, um, digital first, okay, great concept, a bit of a scary concept for many people in the room. And I loved your, your pragmatic first steps of how you would actually go about implementing that, which I think was great. And Eva, you have threw about three or four amazing things, personal branding, mm -hmm. but I think the key one that I liked was this shift in mentality and focus towards career connection. So I'm going to ask all four panel members just to come back on and just to take a huge round of applause from everyone else. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our wonderful panel.